Amen. Uh, I'd like to share from this title today, I'd like to answer two questions for myself. Who and where is Christ? Now, you know, uh, we kind of sometimes just uh, think we have all those answers and, and uh, you know, I, you know, I hurt my leg and I've been trying to elevate it, so when I pray, I've been just laying about right there and I put a chair in that and elevate my leg. I've been laying on my back praying. I was, had my hands up and I said, Lord, I just worship you. And the Lord said, you don't even have an idea how to worship me. I thought I did. So there is a, a realm evidently that I've not tapped into yet to really know worship. Because I thought I really did. I, I was confident that I knew, I thought, you know, just singing praise and worshiping the Lord. And the Lord just said, you don't have an idea how to worship me yet. So, that might be true about Christ. So I'd like to begin in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7 and it says, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude, who's he speaking to? Who's he speaking to? The who? Multitude. The multitude. It's right there. My question will be easy. He's speaking to the multitude. <coughs> now I've seen on Facebook somebody's really, really bad-mouthing uh, mega churches. And uh, in their defense, they was talking about uh, Jesus wouldn't have preached in a mega church. But in their defense, everywhere Jesus went, there was a multitude. And if he just preached to the disciples, he had to sneak away to do that. Because everywhere Jesus taught, the crowd was so big, sometimes you'd have to get into a ship, get out in the sea and teach. So it says here, let's understand, he's not just talking to his disciples. They probably were there. Let's turn this down just, somebody turn this down just a little bit on my page. As they departed, Jesus began to say to who again? Multitude. To multitudes. Concerning who? John. So Jesus is talking to the big group about John. And it says, uh, uh, what went you out to, in the wilderness to see? In other words, what did you expect when you saw John? Was you thinking you going to see a little reed shaking in the wind? Verse 8 says, What went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? I like what the Message Bible says. It says, uh, Was you expected to see somebody in silk pajamas? <laughs> and it goes on to say, People who wear silk pajamas, uh, uh, soft clothing, or in king's houses. Jesus is saying to all of this big group here, what did you expect out of John? You just saw some little, little frazzle out here, just a little upstart that didn't know much about anything. Did you think you are going to see somebody in silk pajamas out there from a king's court? No. He said, he is a prophet, a mighty prophet says, but what went you out to see, verse 9, a prophet? Yea, I stand you, and more than a prophet. Now remember, the multitude still were still under the law. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is still under the law until the resurrection. And I'll prove that with the scripture in a minute for you that need that proof. Sometimes I need it myself, so it's okay. Sometimes I need to confirm it within myself. <clears throat> but you see, the multitude are thinking Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jeremiah, Isaiah. They're thinking those great guys. That's, that's who they always look back to, their forefathers. But Jesus said, this guy's the best. Yea, and I send you, and more than a prophet, for this is he whom it is written, Behold, I will send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way of the Lord. 
Now, this was a prophecy from the Old Testament, almost word for word. Verse 11 says, Verily I send you among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Remember, they're thinking Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, think about it. All these great prophets that their forefathers talked about and leaned on and, and uh, looked up to. And he says, Verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, there is not risen greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I like the Bible, what the message of the Bible says. Now one, no one in history surpasses John the Baptist. But the kingdom that he's preparing you for, in that kingdom, the least would be greater than him. It's a whole new paradise, a whole new way of thinking. That multitude is thinking, here's the great guys, Abraham, Isaac, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah. But Jesus said, John's come preparing you for something else. Everybody's important in the kingdom of God. We can't say just the preacher, just the elder, just the deacon. Everybody is important. And he said, in this kingdom that John's teaching you, even the least is greater than John, than this prophet. John the Baptist was, in fact, the last Old Testament prophet. He was. Even though he had insight to what Jesus, that, that Jesus was coming and starting the kingdom of God. Verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the king and and the violent taketh by force. Now, my concord, my commentary says, and I quote: Men whose mind is made up and who who care not what force and power they employ to attain their object, take it by force. Or in other words, they grasp for themselves like rough and violent bandits, taking seizing their prey. In other words, the Lord is describing the energy which some men are pressing in and urging the need of such energy if salvation is to be obtained because the law and prophets ceased in John. Remember, the few people that followed Jesus, they were, they were tremendous heretics. To accept what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is teaching, they had to really apply themselves and take lots of persecution. They had to just, by force, take this understanding because the whole system, religious system, was against them. Um, let me say kindly. As kind <coughs> as I know to say it, Some of you have experienced that too. Because in this house, we have made decisions to go beyond Passover and Pentecost. And to do that, and to move past that, and understand there's another realm that has never been taught yet, for the most part, there's always somebody that has. We're not a, a lone ranger and we're not an island to them, themselves. There's always been little pockets here and people there that would preach more than just Passover and Pentecost. But as we enter that, you'd be surprised that my friends that come and stay at my house, who call me all the time, are, who, who now call me her in heresy. I've gotten over some of that. But I went through that. People would come through and not even call me. And then later I'd find out they'd come through Kansas City and they couldn't, you know, Brother Mike, he's off in heresy. And one, one minister, a well known guy, he said, you know, stay away from Mike, he's off of that other stuff. It's heresy. We had to press in. But we had to accept there's more than just salvation and the Holy Spirit, there's more than that. 
and the, and we had to press in and take that by force because everything around us, all the religious world, was working against that. You know? Are you with me? Amen. Uh, I guess I'm going to leave some criticism out. It's going to be dead. <clears throat> anyway, it has, it's been hard on me and some of you to stand against that and stay loving. It would be easy to say things hurtful back. It would be easy for Jesus to say, you know, who gives a rip? But he did. Jesus was always kind. We've got to maintain that. Yeah. We've got to smile when somebody comes up here and says something totally different than what we believe. We've got to, to love folks when the people get up here and sing songs that are totally different than what we believe. Y'all a good chance to say amen. Amen. I'm here by myself. You know, <laughs> sometimes I just cringe. But the Holy Spirit said, just keep on loving. Just keep on loving. Just keep on loving. But we have to take what the Holy Spirit is saying. We have to kind of take it by force sometimes and really hang on because there's so much resistance to pull that away from us. Verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now look what Jesus said. This is, a, this is why I'm preaching what I'm preaching today. Because when I read this, and I, I read over it many times, but it just hit me in the stomach. Jesus said, and if you receive it, now who's he talking to again? Multitudes. Who's he talking about? John. John. All right. Who's he, talk, who's he talking to? Multitudes. The multitudes. Who's he talking about? John. John. All right. Look what he said. And if you can receive it, this is Elias. Now, wait a minute. He's talking to the multitude who, who then heard their dads and their grandpas and their grandmas talk about Isaiah years ago. And they knew Isaiah had died a long time ago. And Jesus says, if you can receive it, this is who? Elijah. Elias or Elijah. If you can receive it, can you really receive it? He's talking to the multitude. There's all the multitude out there. Can you all receive this? That this John has been preaching He's really Elijah. Which was to come. Then he goes on and says, He that hath ears to hear, what? Let him hear. hear. Now, age. All them folks he was preaching to had these flaps on the side of their heads. They all had ears. So he wasn't talking about that, was he? He said, all you have ears to hear, in other words, you that have an inner ear, understand I'm saying something more than just a sentence. I'm telling you that this was Elijah, let me say it another way, in the Spirit. But he didn't say in the Spirit. He gives another place, and we'll confirm that. We said, if you can receive this, now they all knew about Elias, and they all knew about these other prophets in the Old Testament. They had heard them over and over and over and over and over in the synagogue. He said, if you can receive it, this is Elias. Look at John 16. The big John 16. And verse 16. Well, I hear pages turning out there. It's music to my ears. I 
I'm sorry, Luke 16. Well, I knew that didn't look great. Right. Luke 16, 16. Instead of John 16, Luke 16, 16. <coughs> The law and the prophets were until who? John. Until John. Now remember, John's preaching in what we call the New Testament. You've heard me say many times, I said it already this morning, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John until the resurrection was still under the law, right? Yes. This confirms that. It says the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time... The kingdom of God is preached, and every man does what? Presses into it. When you when you get when you understand a little bit more than you used to understand, you have to press into it. I'll tell you a little story about a precious lady here. Carol's good to see you back with us. Carol and Jim had trouble with some things that was preaching. <laughs> and so they left the church because I was saying, you know, hell is what we make it. And I've done a lot of teaching about, and I'm, I'm probably leaving lots of stuff out right now in this statement for you that haven't heard it. But I teach that, and I go back to the, the Bibles and to the Civilization was 2,500 years old before hell is ever mentioned. Okay? And, and Moses was using something that the heathen was putting on the people down in the Israelites about hell. He said that the wrath of God will burn to the lowest hell. That's the first time it was mentioned. 2,500 years after, the, after what we know the, the, before, after Genesis 1. And it said the fire of God would burn to the lowest hell. And it says that they would be burned with the fire of hunger. Beasts would bite them. This would happen. That would happen. But once they repented, things would change. Well, Carol and Jim left. Bill was over to her house, and Bill said later, he said, you know what? He said, those folks were studying. They had Bibles all over the table. <laughs> And they came back and said, you know what? You're right. But they had to press into it. That's my point. It don't come easy sometimes. When you hear something so different, when we preach year in and year out, and all of our songs just talk about flying away and the rapture, and you know, we're getting out of here, and, and, and preachers with great anointings would preach that, would say healings in their meetings, we just assume all oh, that's correct. Then you preach something different. Man, you got to press into it and begin to really study. It's like, you know, the bread, when Jesus preached, they, when John, or when, when, when the, in, the New, in the New Testament, when Paul preached, the bread would go check it out. You've got to do that. We had a group of visitors come through here one day, and they knew something was different. They stopped at the nursery, a little girl back there, and she said, they said, man, we can tell something different about y'all. She said, yeah, we don't believe in hell. <laughs> they never come back. <laughs> you know, she, did, she couldn't explain it because she hadn't pressed into it. Some people want easy street, and they think just because they ain't no hell, we can do anything we want to. That's not our message here. We're not preaching that anything's okay. We're not preaching that you can do anything you want to. We're, that's not our message. Our message is when you don't follow the scripture and you don't follow God, you have hell to pay. You've heard that term in the world. You have all kinds of situations that come up that are unlovely. Your, your road is rocky. Your, your road is hilly. You're, you have all kinds of problems because of disobedience. So we never say it. It's easy street. It's easy, everybody would do it. But you have to press in. That's what Jesus was teaching this moment He said the law and prophets were until John. The Lord gave me another word the other day. Did anybody know what happened to John? How did his life end? 
beheaded. Beheaded. You know what? That old message had to lose its head. And there became a new head, which was Christ. Amen. A new head had to spring up. Although John himself had an understanding of Jesus, and he had an understanding that the king, what Jesus was doing, and he was bringing on a new kingdom, it wasn't going to be a kingdom of a king. And his order leads, it would be a kingdom where everybody counts. The least in the kingdom would be as great as John the Baptist. That's, you know, sometimes in church we still think the preachers way up here, listen, we're all on the same, we're all starting to cross. Some people have pressed in a little harder than maybe others, but everybody counts in the kingdom. In the kingdom of God. God wills everybody. Amen. See, in, in Christendom, we grow up with the idea that, you know, this is a good old boy here, that poor guy's going to hell. We have good boys and bad boys in our thinking. And there are folks out here that are not so good. Don't get me wrong. But I'm telling you, in the economy of God, God loves them both. Doesn't mean he approves of them both. But God loves them both. They're both loved by God. Christians might not like them. We may have our differences, but God loves them both. It's... You know, I... I Went to, we had a family reunion yesterday at, at Mount View. And I was down there a few weeks ago on Tuesday. And I went over to the old church there, and they asked me to minister. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you just can't throw out too much to people who are not ready for it. But after the service over, and everybody left, the pastor and his wife was standing there. And I told the story about what I said to Robin. Robin, your car is a, is it MG? Robin's got this little convertible, MG. What year model is that? 74. 74. Oh, he's pretty. I see him take them grandkids. I see it on Facebook. He takes the grandkids on little rides. And him and Ted was it was a top down in the summertime. And, and uh, I said to Robin one Sunday, I said, they probably wouldn't sell it to me, but <laughs> I probably not got it for sale sign on it. But if it did, and I bought that car, and I paid him what he's asking. He gave me the keys. Who now owns it? Mm -hmm. I do. Excuse me. I own it. When Jesus went to the cross, he bought the whole human race. Amen. The pearl of great price wasn't us finding Jesus. The Bible says we weren't, you know, we weren't looking for him. The Bible says he found us. The pearl of great price was he found humanity and he bought them. Because Adam gave all of his authority to Satan and Satan became the prince of this world. Who became the prince of this world? Satan. Well, when Jesus came along and after his, his, his death, burial, and resurrection, the first thing Jesus said, all power is given me in heaven and earth. My question to myself is, Mike, don't be up here talking about the devil. Because he, Christ has all power, not a little bit. So if he has it all, why do I mention him? Why do I take the divine energy comes into me to say the devil this, the devil that, and then we change it to the enemy and I don't know. Parker Saint plays a song here at prayer meeting for him and Carl does. It says, fear says, or fear is the enemy. How that says the liar. Fear is the liar. That's who talks. It's not the devil. It's most of the time it's what we don't know about God. Fear talks. Anxiety talks. And all of that's based on what we see and we perceive with our our five senses. What we perceive with our five senses, we take on it and, and make it real sometimes when it's really not. It may be real to you at that instant, but in the overall scheme of things, 
in the economy of God, his power is greater. He has all power. You know, my problem is, is me believing that. Amen. And when you're hurting, it's difficult to believe it. It takes a pressing in. Now, as Americans, we're spoiled. We really are. Third world nations, they don't have a doctor to come take the kid that's still out or, you know, I had a hernia. And, you know, I had a double hernia and they operated on me. And, you know, if I was going to live in some place, I'd just have to put up with it or die from it. We're, we're spoiled here. And, and I'm not against doctors. If, if they help you, hallelujah, wasn't it, Mike? <laughs> Amen. God gives them the energies and the callings to do that. I think there's a lot of good doctors that they just grow up with that 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 want to. That that that's. I feel like it's a calling, just like to preach. Emmy thinks she has a calling to be a dentist, and I, she she <coughs> has allergy problems, and she can't hardly stand the the uh, oak trees and stuff. She gets all stopped up. When we, when we go to Mountain View, a whole group of them, we stay at a little resort down there cheaper than going to a motel and we have all the, the niceties of the restrooms and the air condition and all that. Emmy goes and stays with Grandma, Madison. She, she can't stand the trees and we just teased her. We said, Emmy, what if God called you to, to love kind of like Mountain View? She said, he ain't. <laughs> <laughs> she said, first of all, I don't like bugs in the city and there's a lot more bugs down here. <laughs> He said, there are a lot more trees down here. And then we said, well, you're, you're, you're going to, to school, UMKC, and you fall in love with this guy, and he's going to be a doctor. That's what we told her. <laughs> you, you're making plans to get married, and he says, oh, by the way, Emmy, um, I just have this real heart to have a farm, to have, a, <laughs> uh, have all these cattle. She said, He's out of here. <laughs> well, she she has a clear path, and she pressing up into it. She pressing into it. So we say things like that to to keep her in check. To see if that's really her calling, it's just a good idea, you know. So she has a calling to be a dentist. I think it's great. I think there's some doctors that have a calling do that. I'm not against that. But I'm just telling you, God is bigger than all of it. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's bigger than all of it. Thank you, Lord. So, let's look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. Here again, it's a direct prophecy from the Old Testament, but it's quoted, in, Luke quotes it in verse 7, Luke 1, 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, I could have digested that better, Golden, if Jesus would have said, this really is not Elias. He's just coming in his spirit. But he said to this multitude, if you can receive it, this is Elias. Pretty blunt. Sometimes you might have to say some things pretty, sometimes you've got to say things blunt to jar people out of their, to get them to think. But here in Luke it says, he should go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. <clears throat> Again, that's a direct quote from the Old Testament. Why not go back and read that part? But in Matthew chapter 16, no need to turn to it, but Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, uh, uh, Hey, fellas, who do men say that I am? And they spoke up and said, Well, some people think you're John the Baptist. And some think you're Jeremiah. And some of them think you're Elias. And some of them think you're another prophet. Jesus said, to who, Whom do you think I am? And, he's, and Peter speaks up, and he says, Thou art the Christ, 
I want to get your attention. He didn't say you're Jesus. Not that he wasn't. I'm just trying to get you get your mind over in a different realm for a minute. He was Jesus. But Peter said, you are the Christ. What did Peter say? You are the Christ. Christ. Luke says the same story, but Luke says, you're the Christ of God. Didn't say it was Jesus. Christ is not his last name. Christ was the Spirit of God in what He was sent to do by His Heavenly Father. He was anointed to change the whole <laughs> landscape of religion from a man-based performance to a relationship. You know what? I told you a few weeks ago, we need to have some tips for us. Not very often. I had a big one here a couple weeks ago. But we try to get over before dark. <laughs> I was so mad at her, and she was so mad at me. <laughs> she probably wanted to hit me with the ball back. But anyway, she didn't, thank God. <laughs> but uh, I said to her, I said, honey, I'm so glad you reconciled. She said, well, you did it too. <laughs> you had to reconcile too. It's a two-way street. That's where a relationship is. You gotta get over it. You gotta just grow up and get over it. But in the Old Testament, you had to perform. It was all based on man's performance. It wasn't based on a relationship. So <clears throat> says uh, Jesus says, Who the man say that I am? Peter said, You're the Christ. And Jesus said, upon this, he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, but my Father, which is in heaven, he revealed it to you. And this is how I built my church. The gates of hell will prevail against it. The, the church, Elisa, is not built on anything other than revelation. That's what Jesus said. He wasn't talking about Peter. His name means rock. He wasn't talking about that. Because Peter did a lot of stupid stuff later. I mean, in the same chapter, he denied Christ. But Jesus said, this is how I'm going to build my church. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. Rock of what? The rock of revelation knowledge. When it's revealed to you, and you pressed in, you studied it, you know what the scripture says, you know what God says about it. You pressed in, you have a revelation. The light bulb came on in your brain and in your heart. Nobody can take that away from you. That's why in the midst of my friends who say I'm in heresy, I don't fall prey to that because I have an experience with God. I've ex and yeah, I've experienced something in here from just studying the scriptures and sitting up all night long and just studying scriptures and reading verse after verse and reading it in the common in the in the Strong's Concordance and seeing what every word means and, and, and looking at that and just convinced by revelation, not by a book I read <coughs> down at the bookstore, but by revelation of just study and see God wanted me to move on from Passover to Pentecost to Tabernacles. But in each one of them, there was a different understanding. In Passover, we understood about being born of the Spirit. Right? Didn't we? How many of you grew up somewhere in your life in the Baptist Church? wonderful teaching. It brought a lot of people to Christ. My dad would say, <laughs> son, if I didn't know better, I think you was once in grace, always in grace. That's the Baptist doctrine. I'm going, dad, I, I figured out I've always been in grace, not just once. Just always been there. Didn't know it for years. You know? But then the people who moved a little further and began to understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit, even their songs changed. Their songs are more about the Spirit. Uh, more about what God could do and more about healing. You know, the folks that didn't believe in healing when they come to dying and said, you only got three months to live, they'd take a chance on that. I know in school, in college, 
an old agnostic professor was saying, uh, you know, that stuff don't exist. And a lot of students there went to church and they were chiming right in. And I just stood up and I said, it's amazing to me. I just laying on my, chair, on my desk like this and I looked at one of the people and I said, it's amazing to me. If y'all got three months to live, you'll take a chance on that doctrine. You'll take a chance on somebody laying hands on you and getting healed. And you know what they all did? They stood and clapped. I said, where have you been all semester? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, but then there's another realm. You know, you know every generation thinks they're the last one? Just study history. They all think they're the last one. All think Jesus is coming tonight. You know what? I've just got over that. I love the Lord. If Jesus really comes in the clouds tomorrow night or this, to the, this afternoon. I'm happy with that. But that's not my motivation anymore. My motivation is taking the light to the world and loving folks. They're unlovely. And doing things that require servitude from me rather than lordship. We have a family member that's divorced. It's been a nasty divorce. And uh, I call him this week. And I said, I want to do this for you. They were so taken. I couldn't believe it. Well, we believed you would take sides with this, but that's your relative. I said, no, I want to do this. And if they thank me once, go on and thank me 15 times. This is what a believer does. You serve. It's not all about, I'm the pastor and I'm this and I'm that. It's about serving. And I want to serve that person. And it was... Look and I talk about it. It felt so good. I felt like somebody give me a million dollars just to see them blessed. And not be biased by that bitter divorce that went on. And do something in spite of all that. It just feels good to love folks. He said some horrible things. It's all right. Let it go in one ear and out the other. I send a check to a guy that only, he hates my guts. He, he probably hates me, period. But anyway, we just laugh and we just have, I ain't trying to buy his love. I just want to serve him. I don't do it every month. I do it every, when the Lord puts it on me. I just enjoy loving people. Amen. I enjoy serving folks. I'm not quite as good as Parker. <laughs> <laughs> he carries my amp, puts it up. <laughs> he, I, I tip 20%, he tips 100%. I said, Parker, I'm not there yet. <laughs> I said, I said, 100%? He said, yeah, my bill's $35, I tip him 35 I said, Parker, I said, how do you afford that? He said, that's very easy enough. Well, you don't go out and eat very much. <laughs> Well, I ain't caught up with him on that area. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's a servant's heart. That's a servant's heart. And uh, he seems like he he lives to, to serve me, not not serve me as a Lord, but to bless me. He's over to house one one day and just work and work and help me do this, help me do that. Is there anything else, Grandpa, I can do? And I said, no. I said, I think that's it for today. He said, well, I'm going to go home, take a shower, and go to bed. He said, I've really been sick today. I said, sick? <laughs> <laughs> and you've been helping me? Like, well, you, if you told me that earlier, you're just, we can do this next week. That's his heart. Amen. That's his heart. Jesus told him, he said, I'm going to send something. When I go back to the Father, I'm going to send something. I'm going to send a comforter. 
as long as I'm here, partner, Jesus said, as long as I'm here, it's just me. As long as I'm here, the leper can get healed, they'll come to me. The blind will see, they'll come to me. But there's a lot of people out there that won't get to me because they live in another town, another country. But as long as it's just me, they'll get to me. The Greeks came out to see Jesus. And they came to Andrew and to Philip. And they said, Philip, here's Philip right here. Philip, we'd like to see Jesus. This is Andrew. Tell a little bit Andrew. He said, Andrew, let's go tell him. So the two boys get together and they go find Jesus. Said, the Greeks out here want to see you. And uh, Jesus didn't say, well, I need to change shoes and trim up my beard and all that. He said, tell them, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it bite it alone. But if it, if it dies, it's going to bear fruit. bear much fruit. In other words, there'll be a, if I die, there'll be a crop come up like me. If you plant corn, you get what? Corn. If you plant tomatoes, you get tomatoes. You get whatever seed you plant. And he was the seed that went into the ground. He says, I'm going to send some, I'm going to send a comforter. Let's look at John chapter 14. <coughs> <coughs> John 14, 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send, how will he send it? In my name. Thank you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, on verse 26, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said to you. Amen. Peace I leave with you and my peace I, excuse me, I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice. See, they were going to get sad because he's leaving. They said, if you understand what I'm saying, you'll rejoice. Because I said, I go to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And I've told you before it come to pass, that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. And you need to under, underline this next phrase here. It says, for the prince of this world cometh. He's talking about Satan. For the prince of this world cometh, notice what he ends up saying in that verse, and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Let's look at verse chapter 15, verse 26. But when the comforters come, whom I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall do what? He shall testify of me. Now, I want to kind of clear something up in my own thinking. We have been taught as Pentecostals. The Comforter is the Holy Ghost that makes you speak in tongues. I'm not all opposed to that. But I want to go further than that. The Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit of God that was in Jesus reconciling the world and that's what he left in the earth when he went back into the Father. <clears throat> in the next chapter, and first of all, it's in verse 26, he shall do what? Last, last word is in verse 26. He shall testify of me. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth as we're set here on Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. There's people who won't darken a church door, but God loves them just as much as all us sitting here this morning. 
And he has ways of working even though they don't go to church. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul had an understanding more than the, 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 the disciples had when he said, the mystery of iniquity is at work. Hear me clearly. When we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, God is not limited. Let's change it. When the world out there does not listen to the Holy Spirit, because the, the Bible just said here that this Spirit that He's leading in the earth is going to testify to me. When they don't listen to that, God's not limited. It says, Paul said, the mystery of iniquity is at work. Now, how is the mystery of iniquity going to work? When we don't listen to the Lord, then we get in deep duty, pardon me. And we just get all kind of messed up. It's kind of like, I don't know if you all ever went through this. <coughs> Parker, when he was in school, did anybody ever twist your arm behind him and make you say, Uncle? Preston did that? <laughs> oh, you didn't have to go to school. You got it at home, huh? <laughs> go up here and just do that to me. Now, don't do it hard. I don't like pain. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> but kids in my school would do that and say, say, Uncle. Man, it didn't take me much to say, Uncle. But my brother David, you twist his arm up behind his head. No, no, I, I, that's all right. <laughs> that's a good thing. And he wouldn't say uncle until until he just was about passed out. He could take pain out more than I could. But there's a point when you'll say uncle. There's a point somewhere. And the mystery of iniquity, when it works, page, when you get in deep doo doo so bad and you find out this ain't working, I'm in a mess. Ain't nobody helping me. Don't look like anybody cares. That's when we turn and say, Lord, I need your help. The mystery of iniquity did what we didn't let the Holy Spirit do. Does that make sense? That's not God's best. But Paul said the mystery of iniquity works. It's a mystery. The people gets involved in deep doo doo don't understand what's happening. It's a mystery to them. They don't, but it still worked out. They finally said, "Okay, I get it. Lord, I need your help. I know I've got myself in debt, and I've got myself in this, and I've got myself in that. I just need your help, and He, he helps. Do you know what? It don't get you out of it like that, does it? it takes a while. Let's go to the next chapter, Luke, John 16. Nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth. Verse 7. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come. In other words, if I stay here, the leper's going to get healed, they got to get to me. But if I go away, something else is going to happen. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now remember, he's still talking to multitudes. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. I'll sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is what? Judge. Who's he talking about? Who's the prince? Judge. Satan. I want to read this out of the... It is so good. I brought my message Bible along. I've got to read that out of the message Bible. This is just knock your hat in the creek. It's so good. All right. Here's what the message Bible says. When he comes, talking about the spirit of truth, he'll expose the error of the godless world's view of sin. The world's view of sin is drinking, drugs, help me out, cussing, cigarettes, you know, that, you know, the list, list goes on and on and on. Notice here. When he comes, he'll expose the error of the godless world view of, world's view of sin, righteousness, judgment. He'll show them that their, their refusal to believe on me is their basic sin. 
that righteousness come from above where I am with the Father out of their sight and control that judgment takes place listen to this as the ruler of this godless world is brought to trial and convict Satan was brought to trial in John 20 he said the prince of this world is cast out I like that he's cast out now Try to line this up to close. Might take me a while to do that. How does this all relate to Christ? Remember, we started with two questions: Who is Christ, and where is He at? Who is Christ? Is He this guy who walked the shores of Galilee and healed the sick? That's part of it. But Christ was the Spirit of God that was in Jesus and when Jesus went back to the Father he left that in the earth called some places a comforter Christ is the deposit of himself that infiltrated the whole entire human race just like I said John 20 12 20 says uh, or John 20 12 when the, the Greeks wanted to see Jesus and Jesus said that Unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies by it alone. The Message Bible says, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. Listen to this, I like this. But if it's buried, it sprouts and re reproduces itself. That's what Jesus is doing in the earth. So for me, now, uh, I'm going to get, this is a heavy one, I'm going to lay on you. If Jesus is going to reproduce himself in the earth, he does it through us. Amen. Amen. Now hold on to your seat. Fasten your seat, but I'm going to make a, a hard statement here. It wouldn't be hard for you, but in other churches, if I went and said this, it would be total heresy. For me to preach, Jesus come tonight in the rapture, is a total I'll make it easy. Misnomer. It's a total defiance of what God wants to do in the earth. Does that make sense? For us to teach people we want to get out of here tomorrow night is to not to do what he said to do. For Jesus is replacing, re reproducing himself in the earth so Christians have got to get their own act together before we can help anybody else. Right? I never get my act together with Linda. I only get mine at her once in a while. A lot less than I used to. It's, it's developing and getting better. But I've got to get over it, Andy. Because it's got to work at home first. It won't spread much further than home till I get it worked out there. It's better. Oh, yes. Now, I always loved it. I mean, we're all about the prettiest girl in town. And I told her this morning, I said, we had this big family reunion yesterday. And, you know, a lot of people don't even know each other. Spread all over the country. So, uh, they'd say, who's your wife? Who's your wife? And I'd say, well, I'm married into Smith, but her mother was married. Well, she did say, I'm in the Smith family too, but which one are you married to? And I said, I point to Linda. And I told her this morning, I said, honey, I so enjoyed pointing to you. But she's the prettiest girl there. And she said, I enjoyed pointing to you too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, but I'm overweight. And, I don't mind. She said, I'm, I'm in pay attention to that. I love you. That felt good all over the morning anywhere else. <laughs> but that's a relationship. That's a relationship. <clears throat> so, but my my reproducing Jesus has got to be worked out in its fullness at home. It's spread out. I've, I've been effective other places too. But I'd be much more effective if I didn't even be tainted with just a tiss at home once in a while. Get over that. Don't say amen, Father. <laughs> <laughs>
she sides in the mom. <laughs> no, she sides in the male when I'm right. <laughs> What's that? That's never. <laughs> Do you remember? That's never. Hey, <laughs> that didn't mean any help of you. <laughs> anyway, uh, Second Corinthians five. We got to get ready. Get ready to go home. Second Corinthians five. We got thirty minutes, but I ain't gonna take that much. Second Corinthians five. Verse 18, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation to win or to know, that's an old English word, it means to know that Christ was in God. I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. To wit that, that God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. That's an accounting term. He's not charging it against us. In the Old Testament, they were charged. It was charged against them. In the New Testament, in the, in this message of the kingdom, it's not charged against you. Doesn't mean you get by with it. God just don't love you any less. You know why do we have problems if we mess up? Because it's a seed we sow. Paul said, "Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that's what he's going to reap." Judgment's not coming on America because America's sin. It's their sin, the seed they've sown, causes it to uh, be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, the seed you sow is what you reap. It comes back to you. Verse 20. Now then, since we're reconciled to God, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God didn't beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. I want to ask Robin a question. He has a degree in political science. So he's probably more qualified to answer this question. <laughs> Robin, the best of your ability, in a short statement, what does an ambassador do in another country, a U.S. ambassador? What's his primary job? He represents the president. He does what? He represents, he represents the president. Good answer. Better than mine. So, if he represents the president, then if the president can't be there, his word is as if the president was there. Is that correct? Okay. So it says here, now then, since we're reconciled to Christ, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray for you in Christ that be you reconciled to God. Then it goes on to say, for hath made him to be sin for us, so he did not any sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Now let's go one more scripture and we'll wind up. Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, it says, To, to whom God would, I'd like to read some other scripture, but I, I don't want to labor too long. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles. It was a mystery among the Gentiles and the Jews as well. Notice what the mystery was. Which is Christ where? In you. In you. What is it? The hope of glory. Christ in you. That was the mystery. That's what people couldn't put together in their minds. What is what is this? Christ in you. So we've, now we found out where Christ is. He's not in heaven, right? Christ in you, that's the mystery. So if Paul was right, and we are ambassadors, so when we speak, who else is speaking? Christ. Thank you. You're on top of it. We can close and go home now. <laughs> if you speak, if we understand that, Christ is speaking. So then everything you speak to needs to honor that. Here's the problem. We just don't believe it. I have struggles with that. I'm not trying to say I'm wrong. That's why I shut my eyes and pray for people. I need to get grown up so much I can say be healed. That's what Jesus did. 
He didn't shut his eyes real tight and pray these long prayers. He got off by himself and prayed. Got a word for you. The nutritionist that talked to Carla about fasting and not fasting is true in the natural. But I want to encourage you. When God tells you to fast, follow God. Follow us. Sometimes when you quit eating, your body don't function right. It's made to, the nutritionist said your, your body's like a furnace. It's keep burning. When you quit putting stuff in there, it goes out. It has to take time to start up again. So she was talking against short fast. And the Lord spoke up to me. I didn't want to say it to the day. I felt impressed. I wasn't going to even tell you that, but I felt impressed to say, when God tells you to fast, partner, you do it. God will honor it, and your body will follow suit. It might not be what's normal. It might not be what's natural. But God's chose the foolish things, the Bible says, of the world to confound the, what we call the world, the wise of the world, the wisdom of the world. It confounds them. They don't understand. In the natural, that's what does happen. But when God ministers to you, the fast, do it. Okay? Is that all right? This boy fasts a lot. That's why he's had a lot of miracles happen. Mm -hmm. When you fast, your body don't can't argue with you as much. When I pray for people, <laughs> my brain argues with me. But they got leukemia. But they got this. Fasting, the Bible says, sometimes these things don't happen without it. This kind comes out by prayer and fasting. It's, it's not an issue with God, it's an issue with us. That's right. So when you speak, you're speaking like God, you're ambassador. So often, we speak what we feel, we taste, touch, smell, hear, see. Our five physical senses sometimes is our dictator. It only protects us in the, in the outward realm. You, you don't want to touch a hot stove, right? Uh, Cher was saying the other day in Texas the ground was so hot when she got out someplace it, it burnt the sole of her shoe. So, you know, feelings is not bad. It's just not our spiritual director. It's our natural director, but not our spiritual director. And sometimes we we get these these uh, feelings or we feel things, we you know. I don't have to say. Let's just don't let our five senses be our director. Let's let the Holy Spirit be our director. Uh, our language should always be the language of the Spirit. I want to try one more scripture here. Second, 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. Now, since we have nobody put this scripture on the screen, I appreciate y'all bringing your Bibles and looking at us. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 4. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world. What's the last three words of that ver verse? Okay. I rest my case. <coughs> How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, are mature, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the prince of this world that... Help me out. That what? Come to naught. That's an old English word, naught. It's also the same word, ought. Now, the old timers where I grew up in southern Missouri, they would never say zero, they say ought. 
And that's still in our vocabulary. If you're a gun person, you have a 30 odd six. You don't say 3006. It's 30 and then odd six. It's the same as not, same word. So it says the princes, oh yeah, nor the princess world that come to naught. That's another scripture to tell you the devil has no power. He's come to zero. But we speak, uh, we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world to our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, see, the devil is not smart. He's not omnipresent, omniscient. What's the other one? Omnipotent. He's not all powerful, all knowing. You know, he's not all of that. If he had it, the Bible said he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But that is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But, verse 10 says, God hath revealed us, but how? By Spirit. You've got to press in to know that. God has revealed them to us by his Spirit. When I say the word unlearned, I want to use it in a minute. When I use the word unlearned, I'm not talking about people that haven't went to school. Because I found in ministry there's some people who's got a sixth grade education, has far greater insight into this, and some people have a college education. I've also found people with a college education has much insight in the scripture. So intellectual understanding has, has not a lot to do with it. But when unlearned people speak doubt and fear, they often say, well, it's just reality. No, it's what your five senses are telling you. I'm talking about referring to the things that their senses perceive. In other words, when there's no money in the bank or your pocketbook, the unlearned would say, I'm broke. The, those who speak the wisdom of God, it's a mystery to most people. They don't understand it. Paul said, it's a mystery. But we who speak the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God would say, if there's, I ain't got my bill for me, but if there's no money in my pocket, and my bank account's down to three bucks, if you're going to speak the wisdom of, the, of the God, he'd say, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I am supernaturally supplied in all my needs are met. Now look, you've got to press into that one too. That don't come easy. Because our senses see the bills on the table. That don't mean go not go work. Work, as David Ramsey says, is your greatest weapon against death. Don't say sit at home. It ain't going to follow any like ripe cherries falling off the tree. You know? I told Dwayne the other day. He's getting lonely. Come up here. No job. No house. And he's lighting one cigarette right off another one. <laughs> and I said, Dwayne, Dwayne, when one door's closed, God opens another door. You can't see with these eyes. But it's in the wings. I might not say in the wings, but I mean it's it's out there. So I had a little accident in my truck. It's over in the body shop. He says, Can I ride over with you? Said, yeah. He rides over with me and I would check, see when they're gonna start on my truck. They got a big sign up there hiring. So <laughs> the wings are okay, this is the body shop guy, the main guy, it's over the whole body shop of the semis. He said, uh, are you hired? What's the way you do? He said, oh, you just go online. He said, okay. He said, oh, by the way, what's your credentials? Dwayne told him, oh, here, just fill out this application. Bring it in in the morning. And he wrote two names down. Make sure you show it to these two guys. He brings it back the next day. They hire him on the spot. It starts at $25 an hour. 
said, we're going to put you over some people. He says, and with your credentials, you could have money through Friday. He said, I have one stipulation. I go to church on Sunday. I didn't get this straight from him. You don't have to help me off. I misrepresent this story a little bit. Was the boss that you're talking to, was he a retired preacher or his dad? He was. He was? Yes. yes. And his dad was a pastor too, wasn't yes. Okay. So they understood what he was saying. So with your credentials, you can have money if you try to. And after you're here 90 days, we'll send you to Texas two weeks. We'll help you to 40 bucks. And one door closes. Another door open. Amen. Amen. But in between that, <laughs> that's when we have a struggle. In between that. And that's when you've got to, by the eye of faith, you, can't, you don't know what to say. He didn't say, Lord, I thank you for Peter Belt, because he didn't know about them at the time. All you can do is, Lord, I thank you, you supply my needs, and you're not, you didn't bring us up here to let us suck us up in a vacuum. You brought us here to make life better. Nothing against brief being. But God never brings you to something lesser. In all of us, He brings us to something better. Amen. You know what? He loves to win us. Tina. But I, I didn't coax him. I didn't coerce him. I didn't coach him and say, Now listen to Wayne. Make sure you get Sundays off. <laughs> but he made that decision on his own. I got that one stipulation. I went off Sunday. You know what? God honors that. Love you, buddy. Tell you, good man. All of you, good men. Happy Father's Day to all of you. In closing, speaking the language of the kingdom of God requires discipline. That's why Jesus said, you've got to take it by force. Sometimes you've got all this pressure. Says you, you got pressure, and I'm sure Dwayne and, and Tina had pressure in their own head. What, what am I doing here? I don't have a house. I ain't got grocery money. I ain't got this. I ain't got that. You know what? God had a plan. And that helps us. And that's a milestone for you, Dwayne, to tell somebody else. To help somebody else. Paul said that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. That same spirit is in us. John even doubted, even though he came preaching the kingdom, John even doubted, and when he is in prison, he said, could this be Jesus the Christ? He's the only one that really knew he was. But sometimes, Angie, with all that we know, that doubt works, don't it? And Jesus said, Go tell John, the lame see and the deaf hear. Blind eyes are open. Go tell John again what the girl sang today. Go tell John again the, 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 the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. In other words, yeah, it's me. It's me. So when we have that temptation to question the fact, really, am I Christ personified? Is really Christ? Did he go back to the Father or is he in me? Jesus said, if you can believe it, this John the Baptist guy is really a lies. You can believe it. I'll say another one. Brother, you can believe it. Christ is in you. More than just Jesus. That same spirit is in Christ that caused deaf ears to hear and blind eyes to see. That same spirit's in you. And it's in other people. They don't know it. So rather than tell people I'm leaving here tomorrow night and I'm going to be raptured out of here, I'm not going to tell them that. I'm saying, listen, the Spirit of God is here. Here to love you. He's here to tell you, Tim, there's such a thing as not being on dialysis for the rest of your life, bud. Thank you, Father. You
Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Glory be to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Does anybody want special prayer this morning for anything? Yeah. We've got a family reunion coming up uh, next weekend, and so I've been making a lot of phone calls, and um, my mom's younger sister, my cousin was saying she's not doing well, but um, I called dad's brothers about the family reunion, and uh, his uh, next younger brother, Harold's not doing well. He's been lacking oxygen uh, since January, and his grandson, uh, during the Super Bowl, had a massive heart attack, and he's not been able to speak or walk uh, since. And so his mother asked me for you know me to tell the family and, and everyone a united prayer, and I wanted you all you know to agree with me. Okay, you pray, and we're going to listen to you. And we're going to agree when you get through. Almighty God, you are so great, so marvelous, so wonderful, Lord God, full of power, Lord. We trust and believe in you, Lord, for your word says that you, the stripes that you receive was for our healing, Lord. Lord, we unite together in spirit, Lord, in you, Lord, for healing for these family members, Lord, that is a part of your kingdom, Lord. For you leave no one out, Lord, and there's no distance, there is no barrier, Lord. Lord, we just believe and trust in you, Lord, that you are just descending you're, you're here all around us Lord but you are filling their body right now with healing Lord we are claiming it and believing it uniting together in you Lord and trusting and believing Lord we thank you and we give you all glory honor and praise Lord we can't honor you enough Lord but I love you myself so thank so you. much Lord and I praise you thank you for all things in Jesus precious name Amen and everybody said Amen. Amen. Anybody else? I've got something. Okay. Hey. Right. Uh, I, uh, I want to. Somebody step back to that. I know this is Father's Day. seen a lot of it down through the years and I've seen God bless them I've seen him bless their lives I've seen him take them from places that people here that don't know couldn't even fathom and he's blessed them and he's continuing but I see God increasing this body and bringing it to a new realm I've seen it for a long time and there is uh, there is things and channels through life that we have to go through 
And, and I think we need to show him the honor and respect as the father of this church. And if we would, you know, the Bible says how lovely on the mountain are the feet of them that bring good news. I, I don't know anybody else in my life that's brought more good news to people than these two. Abraham was the father of many nations. They have no idea how many nations they've fathered. But today, I would like it. And I know God would if we just honor him. I'm just going to ask him to stand down there. We're going to sing. And all God wants is it's respect and honor if you just come by and tell him how much you love him. And this week, continue to hold him up in your prayers and hold this body up that we'll be prepared for what God's sending our way. This is a healing place. This is a healing place. He wants to use each and every one of us. And in order to do that, we have, be, have to be submissive not only to God, but to and, and reverend our pastors and our leaders. Hello.
And I thought when you spoke to who you were speaking to Father, and you're looking for some time, some day, somewhere, somehow, and you can point the finger at somebody and say you're healed. My question is this. You can point to the storm and the stuff. You point to the rain and it stops. The same God that does that. And the same God that can put power in that finger when you say be healed. Let's remember the Richardsons. A few days back, I got a text from them. They were praying that that a visa could be extended. His sister-in-law, Dave's sister-in-law, passed away. So let's pray for them. Keep them in our prayers the next period of time. And hopefully we will see them soon. Amen. The 22nd of this month, that's not far away. That is Barbara Snedden's birthday. Now, she happens to be in Tennessee right now. Her address is in the church directory. And you know, we are in the electronic age. <laughs> and it goes fast. But for some of us perennial citizens, <laughs> those cards are nice. So keep her in mind. That's what he said. Will you please? How many of you have ever went to a church dinner and you ate your dessert first? Oh, yeah. How many have ever done that? Okay. Can you set that before you leave? <laughs> we got plenty of back. Go help yourself before you leave. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Remember, no gathering this month.